Now, verse 21. This is probably one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. But now, the righteousness of God from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. And here is, amongst the one who believe, there is no difference of persons. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as, you, as we saw it in verse 10 and on. Now, 24, if you will do good to underline it. Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This eliminates all the problems that you saw in chapter 1 and 2 and part of the 3. Who is Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation? Propitiation means to pay in full. By His blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Why? To demonstrate at the present time, not our righteousness, but his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier. Of who? Of everyone? No. Of the one who has faith in Jesus. Wow! There are a few things that we have to clarify here so we will not accuse the Bible of things that the Bible is not saying. Let me check out something here. Verse 25, propitiation. A propitiation means to pay in full. To uh, the wrath of God has to be propitiated, has to be paid. By what? By expiation. Expiation means to put away your sin as far as, far as the east is from the west. Expiation, Jesus covers with our blood to propitiate the Holy God, to pay the Holy God for our sin. And it is done through faith. The moment you believe, you are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Um, I understood propitiation to say that it is the appeasing of the wrath of God. Appeasing. To imply that we pay God in full. Jesus. Jesus is paying God in full for our sin. Because, and, and it will be good to write that down. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Because the one who had no sin, God made him sin for us. So therefore, the wrath of God that was coming upon us came upon Jesus. You should have seen last night the fury of Jesus. Remember that? In front of sin. He knew that one week after he resurrected Lazarus, he was going to go on the cross carrying for the sin of everyone who believed. So, by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate not my righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God. Look at this. Because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sin that were previously committed. Wow. God doesn't pass over anything. 
<laughs> absolutely nothing because he will be unfair if he does. He will not be God. He doesn't let anything go over, pass by. This pass over doesn't mean that he kind of ignores it. Uh-uh. He pass over. Those are the, that's the reason why Greek, to learn the original language, is so important. He pass over. Look at me for a second. All the sins of the people in the Old Testament, including David and everything, they were held there for a while. And he passed them over to Jesus. Did you get that? But they didn't go unanswered. They didn't go unanswered. They, they, yeah. They he passed them them. over to Jesus. And when Jesus died, he was carrying the sins of Solomon and David and Abraham and all these people that, passed o that were held on. They were passed over to the Lord Jesus. From the time of Adam. From the time of Adam. Even Adam is covered. That's why there is only one plan of salvation. And that plan is Jesus. Sacrifice is provided in temporary time. Right. And then it came, it passed over from that to Jesus. Some people try to understand that it's, he just ignored them. He doesn't ignore anything. Now, how do I know that? And how do you know that? Because of the next verse, or the, 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 the following verses. Let me, let me just go into that. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. How he could demonstrate his righteousness if he doesn't cover some sins? That he might be just and the justifier. I will underline those two words. Just why? Because he punishes every sin. He just, he should have said, it doesn't matter. I forgive some. But he cannot do that. Because he will not be just. El que la hace, la paga. Anyone who sins, pays for it. And you pay yourself, or you get somebody to pay for you. And that body who pays for you, in this case, is the Lord Jesus. So, if he did not punish Jesus, and just say, it doesn't matter, he will not be just. That's why he is just. And he himself is the one who receives the punishment in the body of Jesus. That's why he is the justifier. Because by receiving the punishment, God is just, and God at the same thing, time gives justification to the ones who believe in Jesus. It's, that is a very difficult concept, isn't it? But it is so important that he is at the same time the just, and the, uh, for one, for everyone, no. Of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's why Jesus did not die for everyone. But only for his sheep. Only for his people. Now, let me repeat this. One blood of the blood, one drop of the blood of the Lord Jesus is sufficient to pay in full for everyone. But the plan of salvation is for the ones who believe in Jesus. I, I'm not saying that. And don't get angry. Because that's what the Bible says. Then, if it doesn't depend upon me, where is my boast in them? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. It's a brand new system. We arrive in the New Testament. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. I will underline that. You don't have to be perfect in order to be safe. 
You don't, you don't have perfect on your, on your own. You have to be perfect with the perfection of Christ. But on your own, you never can be perfect. So, the Roman Catholic Church here is wrong. Because the Roman Catholic Church says, you are saved by faith plus works plus charity. And here it says, let me read it again. And the word to underline there is apart. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That's it. We can go on with life. So what is chapter 3? It's about faith. That's verse 28. Larry, will you? Okay. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? This was tough for the Jewish people. <laughs> because they thought that Jesus, the Messiah, was coming only for the Jewish. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, and they are circumcised through faith, no more circumcision for salvation. Do we then make void the law through faith? So now let's go and sin. And the answer is, certainly not. You still are responsible to obey the Ten Commandments. To demonstrate that you have faith. And to demonstrate to your heart. Because we can, we can pretend with other people. Then comes, um, uh, do, um, uh, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law, which means we pay attention to the law. We don't want to commit adultery. We don't want to lie. We don't want to destroy the Lord's day. We don't want to steal. We don't want to, because you now believe. And then chapter 4. The chap we, are you together in agreement that this is the chapter of the faith? Chapter 3. Yeah. Yeah. What about all the law that, was, that Moses gave regarding um, the priests and all your sacrifices for all your sins that are in Leviticus? Yeah. So it says we uphold the law. Is the law strictly the Ten Commandments? What about those sacrificial laws? Okay. That is the moral law. And the, what is the other law? The moral law and the, no, no, no. Ah. There is the moral law included in the Ten Commandments. We are, but I forgot that word. The, the, the sacrificial laws and all of those things. Jesus came in chapter 1, chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 17. He came to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law. He fulfilled the law for us. Therefore, all those laws. Let me give you an example. The Old Testament Is it has... Law that you're of? No, 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 natural law. law. Versus natural Mo law. No. The no. Law. no. Uh, I, I'll get to it before... before uh, when Pastor Walter comes, we'll ask him. How is that? the terminology, but in the old sacrificial law, the priests were the intercessors between the people and God through blood of the animals. Jesus came and in the book of Hebrews replaced 
the priesthood of men and replace the sacrifice of blood by the blood of just one lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and did it once and for all. And therefore, that particular sacrificial law is eliminated. So that really didn't take place until 70 AD, correct? 70 AD. The temple was formally destroyed. The sacrifices that were taking place at the time post-Jesus' death. No, it came, the, 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 the elimination of the priest was inaugurated the day of atonement in Calvary. And the change of priesthood and the change of the law of the sacrificial law is changed with the sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice of Christ, when Jesus paid in full for the sins. Then the Jewish people continue, and God, under General Titus from Rome, God destroyed the temple. Para cumplirla. He came to fulfill the law, and he submitted to the law, and raise the bar. So he became both the temple and, and the, the sacrifice and the priest and all. everything. Okay. Thank you. I just looked at him. Thank you. Ceremonial law. Ceremonial law and the moral law. Moral, moral. La moral, la ley moral. And the law of sacrificial. Oh, what, what was did you call it? Ceremonial. 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 Law. You now you can you can eat pigs if you want to. Yeah, I will advise you. But go ahead. Okay, chapter four is the chapter of grace, and I better read it because it, it goes faster when I read it. Uh, but basically, it says the following. Abraham was justified by faith, but not because of the work that he did. Because if you do work to be justified, you get pay. If you work, you get pay. But if you don't work, and they give you a check, that's a gift. Okay? And that is chapter 4. So I don't have to read it. Yeah, let's read it. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God as faith, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are counted as grace, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So if anyone tries to fulfill the law to make God forgive your sin, then it's not grace any longer. It's payment. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And uh, David says in Psalm 32, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? And then he demonstrates to the Jewish people that circumcision does not save. They really believe that they were children of God because they were circumcised. 
Und hier die Zeichen AA. Äh, in The sign of circumcision was received after Abraham believed, not before. So that is one of the questions that many people have. If you equipped baptism with circumcision, if you say it's the same, then you have, there are questions there. It says because Abraham believed first and then he was circumcised. Oh, like uh, say that. that I, I'm just going to leave it alone. Because this can create a lot of conflicts. Okay? Just, just out of pure curiosity. And I hope this doesn't go anywhere, but... <laughs> it's on tape, man. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this. Just out of curiosity. And... We are free to think, isn't it? I have to tell you, the uh, Seminario Reformado Latinoamericano, this semi SRL seminary, doesn't take a size of the Baptist or Presbyterian. We are reformed. And we honor both the Baptist of the Presbyterian and the Baptist of the Reform, of the of the Reformed Baptist. We honor both the Westminster Confession of Faith and the 1689 Conf uh, London Confession that is the Reformed Baptist Confession of Faith. But can we play a little game? Did you want to play? Sure. Okay, it's dangerous, but let's play the little game. Just for the sake of it, this doesn't mean anything. But let's replace the word, if baptism and circumcision are the same. And I don't want you to quote me any, in any place, because I am not taking a position. Is clear on that? Okay. Now, but let's play this little game. If circumcision and baptism are the same or are equivalent, then I think I'm going to lose all my students. Then let's change the word circumcision for baptism. Okay? I'm going to read it. Uh, nine. Four nine. Does this lesson expect upon Does, the only? Go ahead, keep reading. Or upon the unbaptized also, for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was baptized or unbaptized? Not while baptized, but while unbaptized. <laughs> and he received the sign of baptism, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still unbaptized, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are unbaptized, the righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of baptism to those who not only are of the baptism, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still unbaptized. When did he come to faith? Before baptism. Before baptism, before circumcision. Right. But what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It both. Because what is proven is that the baptism of water doesn't save anybody. Both are a sign of faith. Both are just signs. Okay? I think I saved, I saved it. I say. So if I understand correctly, <laughs> baptism is not a requirement. It is. It is an ordinance. It says, if you, he, that was the last word of the Lord Jesus Christ before he went to heaven. Go into the world, present the gospel to everyone. After you present it, the person believes. Teach him to do everything that I told you. 
which means disciple the person, and then baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. While baptism of water doesn't save anybody, it is an honor. It's an honor to receive that baptism and to proclaim to everyone who is watching, I declare that I trust in Christ alone. And wow, it's, it's, one, of, it's one of the most... When I, when I was baptized, after I came to faith in Christ, Mimi and I, we invited so many people, <laughs> unbelievers and everything, because it was the moment to proclaim that we are not ashamed of the gospel. It was, it was something special. But it doesn't save. You are safe by faith alone. Otherwise, rip these pages out of here. <laughs> you know, we are wasting our time. <laughs> You know, because it's by faith alone. Okay. Now that I cause you a lot of problems <laughs> with God. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made to no effect. Which means if you trust in that baptism of children, that's why the Presbyterians will not baptize children to save them. You know that. They is only a covenant that they eventually will come to faith in Christ and will be saved by what? By faith alone. Some of the Baptists, when the child is born, they do the presentation of the child, which is basically, you know, the same thing. But waiting for that child to come to faith in Christ to be safe. Okay. Um, so... I have to tell you something, to quote, uh, uh, caution you in that. Um, 16. Oh, the, the promise of salvation in verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And then notice the word seed. It doesn't say seeds. Seed is the Lord Jesus. Through the righteousness of Jesus. And then verse um, 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Uh, In uh, verse 20, verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness, his, his trust, his faith. Because in verse 19 it says, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, he trusts God, he believed God, and believed in the promise of the Messiah. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, for it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord. Lord from the dead. So it was given to us. Who was delivered up because of our offense? Again, imputation. And was raised because of our justification. And Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if there was no resurrection, we should be cause of pity. 
because the resurrection is the one that sealed our justification. If there was no resurrection, we, we was, we, the, the, it was not proof at all that Jesus was who he claimed to be. So, there you have it. It says, chapter 4 is by grace alone. It's not by works and so on. And then, now we come to chapter 5. Therefore, this is interesting. Now we have been justified by faith. How many times the Bible has to say the same thing? Justified by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. If you want to be justified by words, 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 throw this Bible away. <laughs> There's no the reason. Yeah. Let's be justified by confession. Let's be justified by the sacraments. Be justified by sacrifices, by peregrination. How do you say that, Anna? Peregrination to the to going to visit uh, Lourdes or Fatima or going to whatever the Buga. <laughs> the procession, a visit to that place. Uh, there are people. There is a mountain in Bogota called Montserrat. It's almost like maybe two thousand feet. People go on their knees from down all the way up to visit a statue of Jesus. And they get justified. In Rome, there is the Scala Santa. It's the holy steps that they brought from Jerusalem to Rome, where Jesus climbed those steps to visit, to be in front of Pilate. Today, still the church claims that if you walk those steps up on your knees and go up, you are justified if you do it on the Holy Friday. It's got to be a Friday. Holy Friday or other Friday, but Holy Friday, you are in. Yeah. Or it's a plenary indulgence. <laughs> All your sins are forgiven. But you have to buy a ticket. Ah, when you get arrive at the top, you... you. <laughs> okay. What are we saying? We are saying faith alone. There is no other way. There is no other way. How can you ignore this? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we had peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were enemies of God. Now we are at peace. Through whom also we have access by faith. What part of faith you did not understand? Into his grace. In which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Now nothing can affect us. No more anxieties. Go ahead, Brenda. you said that that God gave you because the other infusion is what the church gives you in the baptism and that's wrong is what God gave you not what the church no church saves anybody and the principle of the Roman Catholic Church is the infusion of grace through baptism given by the church not by you know what I mean? So that is important. Not only that. 
Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope, we are sure there's no, no room for sadness. Now, hope does not disappoint us because God, the love of, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. That's the infusion you're talking about, by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. For, look at this. When did we, then when we did get saved, when, when we were trying to fulfill all the commandments, we were trying so, to be so good, and God saw that we were so good that he decided to save us. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. When we were turning our back to God, when we were enemies of God. Let me finish that concept. For when we, number six, ver, uh, uh, five, six. For when we were still without a strength. That's a, that's a wrong translation. When we were putrid. When we were sinful, full of sin. In due, Christ, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. If we were being good, you know, somebody might die for us. Yet, perhaps a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners. Not when we were trying to be good, but when we were in our worst time, our worst shape, we were at the edge of hell. Christ died for us. Go ahead, Brenda. I was just thinking um, how it is talks about us being weak and things, and I was going back through my life because you said we all tried to be good. Yeah. When I was growing up, a good little Catholic, I wasn't trying to be good. I just assumed that life went on, and as long as I wasn't killing someone, I was automatically good enough. You were like Larry, huh? Well, then I got to thinking. <laughs> No, probably not. But it's what is self. This concept of what things, why do you think you should be in, get into heaven? Oh gosh, I'm so good. Even more the filthy rags that, that we present to God. Because we really weren't thinking about, I'm good. Yeah. I'm just here, I'm doing my own thing. I'm not hurting anyone. But look at, look at, look at two guys. One is Paul. God saved him when he was trying to be so good, right? He was killing people. He was killing people. He was protecting the clothes of somebody who broke the brain and crane of Stephen with the stones. He was doing good. And then he went to persecute the church in Damascus. He was at his words when God rescued him. David, he killed his best friend and slept with his wife. You know, and killed some of the... And then God grabbed him when he was bad. Much more. Uh, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. See, a little weak doesn't mean a little weak. It means putrid, sinful. Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from what? From the wrath of God through him. That's what we are saved from. And I remember R.C. Sproul. What are we saved from? Remember him? And everyone sin. I say, no. Hell, no. Something worse than that. What is it? The wrath of God. And I remember R.C. saying, and God is in hell. <laughs> remember that? And it says, because if he is not there, 
to punish you. You know, he he's everywhere. Thoughts wrath is hell. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Uh, from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's not only, this is important, dear ones. We are not saved by the death of Christ. That's the passive obedience. But we are saved by the active obedience of Christ by his life, the fulfillment of the will of God. So we are saved by his life and by his death, and we are sealed with the resurrection. Is that amazing? Yeah. It's awesome. I the, before I become somewhat educated in the, in the matter that, that there were a number of ways to appease God, but I realize now from the very beginning it's always been Faith. There's yes. only been one door from the very beginning, not, not multiple doors. No. Then closed and closed and closed because people were not abiding by it, and then he left only one choice. From the beginning, there was only one way. There is Christians who believe in this dispensational. One door and that closes, and then another opens, and he, he really articulated properly. There's only one way. Being reconciled. Abraham. Yeah. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Wow. It will take me back to Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and on. You are a new creation when you live, when you, when you believe. And then, for what? You become, you are reconciled with God. And when you are reconciled with God, 17 and 18 and 19, it says, you become ambassadors of Christ. As if God is pleading to the sinner through you be reconciled to God. Is that what it says? Um, Judy? You were reading with me. Two, five, seven, uh, 17. Now you are a new creation. That's our job, the minister of presenting the gospel so people can be reconciled with God. Continue, please. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting <coughs> us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal Imagine that. God making his appeal through us. Is that a reason to live? <laughs> wow. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Oh, wow. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. That, that is an amazing thing. Why in the world? And that's why we exist as SRL to make sure that we are ambassadors. It's interesting when I am on a plane and somebody says, and what, and, 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 uh, and what do you do? I say, I'm an ambassador. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we are. So when people wonder, I wonder what God has planned for my life, right here it is. It's so clear. So beautiful, as if God is pleading, be through you, be reconciled 
to him. Okay. Um, now, here is another thing. For, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So he, we are saved by his life. And many people, listen to what this is Bob Parsons talking. Many people say, I am willing to die for Christ. And then he looks at you and says, really? That's nice. Are you willing to live for Christ? <laughs> That's a different thing. Maybe harder. It's harder. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just... Oh, this, this, this is incredible. Listen to this. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. Wait a second. Was not through a woman? I would argue that. <laughs> Why through a man? The woman was the one, you know. He could have refused. And if he would have refused... This man did not exercise the gift of protection that God gave men for the woman. Should have intervened. He Should've. was there. If you read Genesis, he was there. And he did not exercise the protection that he should be over his wife. That's why man is there to protect. That's the authority that God has given men, the protection of the ladies. Uh, they are just through one man sin entered, that's just a parenthesis, the world, and death through sin, and thus death is spread to all men, which everyone is born with the original sin, because of all sin. Do you know what you what she would have said had you tried to be right. You're not my boss. Ah, and you <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't let me have what I want. Why are you at work? Oh. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> oh, I want that. <laughs> uh, and then it says, sin, death, reign from Adam to Moses, even over those who have not seen according to the light of the creation of Adam. But, verse 15, but the free gift, there it goes again, grace alone. Free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many die, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abound to many. And the gift is not like the, that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense that's Adam. Death reigned through the one, reigned through the one, which much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through the one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man, righteousness act, the free gift, came to all men, resulting in justification. This all men means all the men who were uh, chosen by God. And, that, and, and we, we'll, we will get into that a little later on. If we, 
for it's by one man's disobedience. Many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might be abound, but where sin abound, grace abound much more. Isn't that interesting? When we have those sins and those thoughts and things like that, grace is there knocking at the door and saying, I'm here. I'm protecting you. So that the sin reign in death, even so, grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we are safe. We are zeal. We are sealed by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, his resurrection. So what do we do? Let's live holy lives. The answer that the enemies of Paul were saying is, oh, now that you say that we are saved, go and sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, certainly not. Oh, heaven forbid. How shall we who die to sin live any longer? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, and that baptism into Christ Jesus means the faith of the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the real baptism. When we believe, we were baptized by the Holy Spirit. So you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. You believe. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism to death. And if you are death to sin, you are not going to live in it any longer. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We are new people. We are brand new people. We are resurrected. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with that which should no longer be a slave of sin. For if we has died, for he who has died has been free from sin. We are. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no longer dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. That's, that's. Likewise, you also reckon yourself. And then he continues through the chapter saying, stop in the name of God. Yeah. Stop sinning. And then he says, You were slave. You were a slave of Satan. Now, now you are a slave of God. You are never free. You are never free. Did you bring the dog with you? <laughs> this is this is Pastor Walter Erickson. He's going to solve the problem with chapter eleven. Okay. So chapter six, we are in chapter six and we, we will get to chapter ten in no time. And that's right. What he's saying is, is now that you are safe, you cannot be a slave of sin any longer. You are never free. You are either a slave of God or you are a slave of Satan. Choose the place where you want to live. You are a slave of God. 
It says, but if you choose to live in sin, remember, mm. verse 23, that the wages of sin is what? Death. But this gift of God, which is faith, is eternal life. How did you get that faith? Into and about whom? And the faith is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then we get to chapter 7. In chapter 7, I am not going back there because I have repeated over and over. In chapter 7, is the person says, now that I am safe, I'm going to... Uh, I am going to work on this law so much that I am going to become perfect. One friend of R.C. Sproul came to him and said, I don't sin anymore. I stopped sinning completely. I'm sinless. And R.C. says, ha, 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 ha. And guess what he said? So let's eliminate chapter 7, and that is a sin. <laughs> because you can't. And the answer to chapter 7 is, what shall I do? What a wretched man I am, trying to live by my works again. So I depend upon the, and the last verse is this. Oh, wretched man that I am, verse 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then she realizes it's not him. It's not my efforts. It is God, the Holy Spirit within you, who brings you into repentance. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And God is there to take care of that for me. Because I trust in him. And then comes, ah, chapter 8. We're almost there. Chapter 8. Now what? We have this beautiful body of salvation. So here comes the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not work according to the flesh but according to the spirit oh what a blessed verse look at the tense in which is written is that it will not be condemnation but when now you are safe you are seated at the right you are seated in glory with the, with the Lord. But chapter 8 reminds you that if true, you are a believer. If you are not a believer, this was good for nothing. And look at the incarnation here of the Lord Jesus. For the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And how that happen? Because my efforts? No. Because of the incarnation. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh I could not do it because my flesh could not fulfill the law. Then somebody had to do it. Who did it? God did. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful nature. Notice that likeness. Not that he became sin. And I mean sinful. But in the likeness of sinful nature of men, flesh, on account of sin. And he condemns sin in his flesh, in the flesh. So he is truly man and truly God. 
that the righteousness requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. See, God has to fulfill the requirement in Jesus. And then he says, but if you live according to the flesh, then your minds are on the flesh. And he continues to say that you cannot be a carnal Christian. Because seven, because the uh, six, for the carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life in peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, not indeed can be. A pagan can not obey. It's not that he doesn't want to. He can't. Because he's an enemy of God. So then those who are in the flesh can not please God. You either believe or you don't believe. How is that to give meat into chapter 6? Obedience. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed, look at those ifs. The spirit of God dwells in you. So it's not easy believism. It's not, I believe in Christ, and now I am set forever. You believe in Christ, now you obey. You do what is right, and you prove to your heart that you believe. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. He does not possess Christ. And, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. This also attacks the carnal Christian. There is no such a thing as a carnal Christian. There was another friend of ours, his Prol, who lived with his girlfriend, and he claimed to be a Christian. And R.C. found him in Europe and said, what are you doing? He says, I'm just a carnal Christian. <laughs> I said, you, you, I have news for you. You might be carnal, but you're not a Christian at all. <laughs> See? But if the Spirit, Him who raised Jesus from dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And it goes on that indicating how wonderful it is that you truly. Truly, if you are a son of God, you know that you are, and you are led by the Spirit of God, and then there is some communications with God within you that your mind does not understand, your body does not understand. You communicate in, in, with words that you cannot even understand, that give you the, the, it's not tongues, but it's something that your mind and your heart does not understand. I don't know if you understand things that you cannot explain with words. And the moment you begin to explain, you destroy the whole concept. You know what I'm talking about? Here it goes. For if you live... Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Uh, for if you live according... 13. To the flesh you will die, but if you spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Fourteen, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are what? Sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage against again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. Oh, what a beautiful thing. The Spirit, listen to this. You, you speak to God with, with, with words that you just don't understand. Look at this. The Spirit himself bear witness with the, our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. For I consider that the sufferings, and then it goes into, of this world are nothing compared to the glory. Yeah. 
for the um, and he says not only us but the entire nature was condemned under sin and the nature is waiting for the resurrection and the expectation of the creation for the revealing of the sons of God we have to be light in the world we have to show the difference um, uh, then it comes the chain the chain um Oh, look at this. Verse 26. I tried to look for that, but I could not find it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, in our lack of, of that fourth, fifth dimension <laughs> that we could not communicate with God. For we do not know what we should pray for us, we all, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which we cannot utter. That's what I was talking about. I don't know if you have been praying sometimes and you are there in your knees or in the chair that you sit to pray every day and you say, God, I don't have anything to tell you. I want you to know I love you. And, and your spirit sometimes just groan with things that you don't even think about it. Isn't that beautiful? Now, uh, 28. We know that all things work together for good for everyone. No. To those who love God. To those who are Call according to his purpose, predestination. And then the golden chain that we already talked about it. I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, the, the, he knew, he predestined those that they predestined. He uh, justified those that he justified. He glorified those that he predestined, he called, and so on. Well, then shall we say these things? If God is for us, and then he comes this beautiful ending. Now I know that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. No height, no width, no sword, no death, no hunger, no insults, nothing, no anxieties, nothing. Not sadness, nothing can separate me. Nor high, nor death, nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow! Paul finished that. Let, let me, let's take 10 more minutes. And then we'll take a little break. But Paul finishes that. I wish I could stand, but the camera doesn't let me. <laughs> but can I stand? Let's ask Simon. This is so important. Paul finished saying that nothing can separate him from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate him from Christ. And now, he begins chapter 9. And Paul, who says that nothing can separate him from Christ, he says, I wish, I tell you the truth, in Christ, I am no lying. He puts the Holy Spirit about his witness. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Paul, for I could wish that I myself were a courts from Christ, separated from Christ, for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Say, Paul, what happened with you? You just said in chapter 8 that nothing can separate you from Christ. 
And now, you said that you are brothers who do not believe the rest of the Jewish people. If he could be separated from Christ for the sake that they will save. He says, of course. He says, I not only want to be separated, I wish, but I want to go to hell. Separated from God forever. If my death will contribute to the Jewish people to believe. Can we do that for anybody? Wow. I won. You kidding? I'm not going to do this for anybody. Paul was ready to do that and calls the Holy Spirit as his witness. And an interaction between the Holy Spirit and Paul begins. Look at the way he says. And he says, God, how could it be? They, they are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternal blessed God. And he says, Amen. He mentions God. He says, Please save all the Jewish people. Please do it. And kill me if you have to do that. Well, who can do that? Uh, it makes you tremble, doesn't it? And the Holy Spirit says, Paul, we already have our Redeemer. Thank you very much. You don't need to die. Somebody already died and went to hell for the Jewish people. And he says, Paul, let me tell you something. It is not, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israelites who are Israelites. Not all are children of God. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Isn't that amazing? And for us, it says the same thing. But the children of the promise are counted as seed. It's only the ones that I choose. And in fact, we say that in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. He came to his own and his own received him not. But what? The beautiful B-U-T. But as many as receive him, to them he gave him what? The right to become the children of God. Who were not of blood, not of the Jewish tradition, not of Christian blood, not of the will of the men of the flesh, not because I want to believe, because I can't, not of the will of men like I did to, to Larry. I made him a Christian the other day, the Pastor Walter. I made him repeat the sentence. What a wrong thing to do. Not of the will of men, mm. but of the will of God. It's those that God wants. And he says, not all, all our children of God. That leaves us with that question. To them who believe it gave, make him the right to become children of God. So all the people in the world are not children of God. Only the ones who believe in Christ alone. All the people in the world who say they are our father and do not believe in Christ, they are lying to God. Because they are not children of God. They are children of Satan. And when they pray our father, they are praying to Satan himself. Because they don't trust in Christ. The Bible says in chapter 1 of John, verse 12, that only the ones who trust in Christ are the ones who are children of God. So in here it says, not all, uh, but it is not that, uh, what is, uh, where was I? Uh, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, verse 8, these are not 
the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as seed. Only the ones who trust in Christ. For this is the word of the promise. What is it? At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Okay? So that son, eventually, is what? The Lord Jesus Christ. Because he came through the seed of Abraham. And then, Paul gets, remember that he said before, why do you blame me of sin? If you made that decision. And the Holy Spirit responds, Paul, that makes you angry? Let me tell you a story. There were two children who had not been born yet. They have not done anything good of evil. But in order that my election, my predestination, my purpose survive, before they were born, one I chose and the other one I hated. You cannot say that without crying. Why in the world God did not pass us by? It's just pure mercy. Predestination is mercy. Look at that. Um, that is those, uh, this says, let me tell you a story, Paul. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, chapter, verse 10. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. When you talk to people, they say, that's not my God. My God will not do that. You're right, because your God is not God. <laughs> The God of the Bible is a different God. What shall we say then? Then Paul answers to the Holy Spirit, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Imagine a man calling God unrighteous. <laughs> this is serious. This is Paul. You know, representing all of us. When we do not accept the sovereignty of God. And God says, heaven forbid. Certainly not. And then he says, Paul, let me tell you. You are talking about unrighteousness. You are talking about justice. But it's nothing about justice. It's about mercy. It's about grace that I've been talking to you since verse 4. What part of that you did not understand? For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then he is, he, then it is not of him who wills, because no one wills. Not of him who runs, because no one runs after God. We, by nature, hate God. But of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says, Paul, do you remember Pharaoh? Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you. And that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills. In whom he wills, he hardens. Says Paul, it's more serious than that. It's not that they cannot believe. It's that I can harden their heart so they don't believe. You will say to me, Paul, in verse 19, sticks his hand at God, his fist, and say, huh, 
why does you still find fault in me? If it is your will, And the Holy Spirit responds, But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? You never will understand this. Remember what I told Job? Did I ask you for advice where I put my moon and my sun and my stars? Who are you? Will the thing that form said to him who formed it, why you made me like this? Does the potter have the power over the clay? And look at this. From the same lump, same bunch of clay, to make. This is, this is grace. One vessel for honor, that's the ones who believe. And another for dishonor. Those are the ones who do not believe. And in verse 22, he speaks in Spanish. God. And says, ¿Y qué? ¿A ti qué te importa? So what? What's the matter with you people? Remember that? <laughs> so what? If God wanted to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure much long suffering, the vessels of wrath, prepare for destruction. This is the double predestination. This is, this is something that we cannot understand. We will never understand. Because we are not gods. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. It's for his glory, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he called not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles. United the entire universe. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. And her beloved who was not the beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. What? It's not anymore sons of Abraham. It's the sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. You see, Paul is not speaking here uh, on his own. He quotes the Old Testament. He calls Hosea. He calls Isaiah. So a number of children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. The remnant will be safe. Oh, Pastor Walter, you save us from that one, okay? There's the remnant will be safe. That's, that's the title of chapter 11 that I am terrified of. <laughs> For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make short work upon the earth. And Isaiah also said, unless the Lord of the Sabbath. See, remember John 44? No one can, John um, 6, 44. No one can come to me. Did you hear that? Is that no one will, but no one can. Unless, that's the necessary condition, the Father brings him. Here it is. Unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Saddam and we would have made like Samora. So what shall we say <laughs> to all of that? What shall we say? This. Nothing. Let it be God, God. 
and we're creatures. Since when the roaches talk to us? You know, we don't have that right. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, he goes back to chapter 2. The Jewish people were after righteousness and they didn't get it. Have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But, if, but, but Israel pursued the law, remember in chapter 2, of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. They were not able to get it. Why? Why is it? Because they did not seek it by faith. Faith in Jesus. The Messiah was there. And they didn't, but as it were, by the words of the law. They continue, after all this revelation, to try to be sanctified. For they stumble at that stumbling stone. And Peter said, I had put a stumbling stone. For the, the pagans would stumble on the stone, and the stone is Jesus, and they trip. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. That's Jesus for the pagans. And whoever believes in this rock, in him, will not be condemned, will not be put to shame. <laughs> what should we say? Anyone who doesn't believe in predestination will have to rip this chapter of the Bible. There is no other way. Now, I want to tell you, this is not the only chapter on predestination. Peter begins his letters like that. Blessed are the God who predestined us. Uh, Ephesians begins the same. The Old Testament is full of that. So this is not really a doctrine invented by the reformers. This has been there forever. 